Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to present this morning. <clears throat> I have 10 minutes to tell you uh, about Lapper Open, give you some data and some practical tips. So um, the data, you, you, there's some of this data is uh, highly debatable, and we can spend the, the entire day talking about it. So I'll give you some brief uh, data points and, and hopefully some useful tips uh, at the end, and keep it below the nine minutes. Uh, <laughs> the uh, disclosures. I'm a laparoscopic surgeon, this is a laparoscopic meeting. So uh, while I have no financial disclosures, there might be some bias that I completely, uh, that I completely uh, uh, put there on purpose. Um, so you feel free to, um, 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 feel free to point out that bias at the discussion. The interesting thing is we're in 2018 and we're still talking about lab versus open. We're still talking about lab versus open in this urgent setting. Um, and, and this is a paper of 1,200 cases of uh, diagnostic laparoscopy. Um, and it includes everything from gyne, apis, liver abscesses, um, perforated ulcer disease. The interesting part about this article is it's 19, it was published in 1973. Um, so, and interestingly, pull up the, the paper, it's, it's really interesting to read. It was a case series from 1966 to 1971 um, in Havana. And so, um, you know, 40, what, 45 years later, we're still going on with the debate. Um, but this is just to say that we're not talking about cutting edge new things. This is something that is pretty much established care. Talk about therapeutics. Well, we're still 30 years ago. Uh, this is uh, 1990. Um, laparoscopic repair of uh, perforated duodenal and uh, gastric ulcers. It, the same thing. Laparoscopic oversewing and an omental patch. We don't do it much, you know, I, I don't know how you guys do it, but it's pretty much the same thing uh, 28 years later. So there isn't a lot um, new in here. Um, so the question is, what? When can you use a laparoscopic approach and when can't you? I think there's, you know, the, there's the advantage of using lapros laparoscopy as a diagnostic tool and the, and the option to be able to be therapeutic at the same time. Therapeutic, I think, uh, for gut, hind gut, uh, there are some pretty clear uh, situations where you can pretty safely go at it laparoscopically. In the middle, well, it's in the middle. So um, you might or might not uh, find laparoscopy to be useful but at least it can allow you to guide your incision. Right, this is a little yes, no, doesn't want to anymore. There we go, okay. So um, a little bit of data. This is, um, this is the Cochrane database, but essentially is, it's two randomized control trials on um, ulcer disease. Laparoscopic versus open. Mortality favors laparoscopy. Operative time and number of reoperations slightly in favor of open surgery. I said the mouse working better. The mouse works better. Okay, let's try the mouse then. There you go. Postoperative ileus, surgical site infection, obviously favors laparoscopy. Intraabdominal abscesses and pulmonary complications. So these are the ones that you will hear more commonly uh, in the setting of, you know what, you should probably do this open because from a respiratory standpoint, this is going to be better for the patient, and you're going to get less intraabdominal complications. You're going to be, to be able to do a washout better. Well, data is, if anything, right in the middle. There's a 2013 paper um, saying that essentially if you're within, um, within the first 12 to 24 hours and you have a stable patient, you should explore them laparoscopically. Um, I think for a perforated ulcer, there's a, if you've gone through the algorithm and you've decided that you are gonna go in um, and, and do this as an operative management, there's a significant chance that one, you're gonna um, get away with it laparoscopically and that you're gonna be able to do an effective treatment laparoscopically. Hindgut, I'm not, I'm not saying that you should do this. The title of the, of the article is actually pushing the envelope um, and doing a laparoscopic lavage in a Hinchy 4 perforated di diverticulitis with gross feculent peritonitis is probably where my bias starts to fade a little bit. Um, so, 
You don't like stool on your field? <laughs> well, you know, on the camera it's a little bit, yeah. Um, <laughs> Got a mixed spirit up there. <laughs> um, but that being said, the article is out there for those of you who want to uh, adventure into that. Um, there is some, some more consensus in Hinchy 3. Um, if you have, a, um, if you have um, uh, gross contamination, but it's not uh, feculent, uh, you can have a good uh, success rate at a laparoscopic lavage. It, it, success rate means 94% of cases, they were able to do a laparoscopic lavage, put some drains in, no resection, um, and you, um, you spare your patient a, um, a Hartman's procedure. 3% mortality, there was a 6% failure rate due to um, ongoing sepsis, fistula, and undiagnosed uh, uh, perforated sigmoid cancer. Small bowel, less data on the small bowel. Um, there are some cases where you're gonna get away with a laparoscopic resection, but it's gonna be prettier. You have to, it has to be the, the one time you're gonna find you know, a perforated meckles where you can do a, um, a laparoscopic resection. Um, but I think it is very useful in those times where you have the free air, you're not exactly sure where it's from, you're thinking it might be um, potentially ischemic or um, uh, perforated small bowel, and you, you want a diagnostic, um, um, an extra diagnostic tool before uh, you do that big uh, midline laparotomy. So in the last three minutes, a few practical tips, um, and those are mine. Feel free to, um, unstable patient, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna open them up. If they're really unstable, by the time you wheel them into the operating room, you're not gonna waste time fiddling around with the scope and then, and then converting it open, granted. Um, this is one tip that I got from an anesthesiologist when I was a resident, and I think it is very true. Spend a little time to resuscitate the patient before you take them to the OR. You're not gonna lose anything by pouring fluids into a patient for an extra 30 to 60 minutes before you wheel them to the OR, but you're gonna lose a lot if they crash and, and you start off on, on full dose pressures because they're not even, um, because you, you're, you're already behind on fluids. Um, so, and, and if you think the people who are managing the patient in the ED are gonna do this, you're wrong. So it, it's, it's on you to go down and say, how much fluids did that patient get? And the answer is probably, well, 500 cc's, um, and, and, and get them uh, resuscitated adequately. If you're gonna do a laparoscopic approach, whenever possible, do a Hassan. In these, in these patients, um, you know, th this, is, this is the way to go. Um, if they've had a nomentectomy, the gyne patients who've had, you know, their, their um, potentially lap procedure and they take all the omentum out and the first thing you're gonna hit with your verse is that dilated lupus small bowel, um, try to do a Hassan. Now I'm a bariatric surgeon 80% of the time, so, there are some patients where you're not gonna be able to do a Hassan. And, and if that happens, well, you'll, you're gonna to have to do a, a varus. The advantage is if they're morbidly obese, there's usually uh, enough, um, enough uh, intra-abdominal momentum to uh, be a little protective when you put your varus. I put it at Palmer's point. Um, things to have in the OR, I think at least an anti-tube and some methylene blue, because. Uh, Again, even today with CT scans, you might get in there and you don't know where the perf is. Um, if you have an endoscope, even better, um, endoscope plus methylene blue, and, and you have everything you need. Uh, but I think that's something useful to, to request ahead of time. Uh, if you think this is gonna be something related to a bariatric surgery, or uh, you're gonna be up uh, around the proximal stomach, I use split legs for most cases. I, I was trained in Europe, so I still use split legs for my lap coles. Um, so, uh, <laughs> drives the resident crazy, but um, it... <laughs> Why do you do that? Um, it, it's, it's habit. It's, I'm, it's, 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 okay. So, Sorry it's, about it's that. a French thing. It's, it's, it's a French thing. It's a French thing. Um, okay. thank you. I'm actually from Switzerland, but it doesn't matter. We all, this is, <laughs> um, convert early. I've converted after like 
30 seconds. You put the scope in, the, the, there, there's, there's, you know, even with 18, uh, a pressure of 18, there's like one centimeter be between the bowel and, and the abdominal wall. You're not gonna see a thing. Don't fight it. You, it's, it's not because you said you were gonna try laparoscopically that you have to, that you have to keep at it for more amount of time than you need. Uh, eight seconds, here we go. Uh, talk to anesthesiists. This is actually not a joke. You, and they will talk back, I promise. Um, <laughs> um, ask them how the patient did on induction. If, and, and they won't tell you that. They'll put them on pressures and, don't, and won't tell you. If your patient crashed as soon as they, at the, as they, um, uh, as they uh, uh, at induction, you might not want to um, fiddle around too long laparoscopically. Ask them how they did when you, when you put your pressures up to 15 after you insufflate. Tell them you're going to insufflate. Um, and um, if you have no room to see, we talked about it. Um, as soon as you've made a diagnostic, if you know you're not going to be able to repair this lap, there's no advantage to keep going at it for another 10 minutes to figure out what you're going to do. Just get the camera out, one other person to talk to, you're, that's it. I'm even out of everything. There we go. Talk to your tech. That's also not a joke, and they, but talk to them. Tell them you're gonna convert. Give them a few two, three minutes so that they can prep things. Before you start the case, tell them what your odds are of staying lap or going, going open. If you think you're gonna go open, tell them just open a camera, that's all you'll need, and then get the open tray ready. Laparoscopic approach, we've talked about this. Uh, essentially, there's a faster recovery, uh, it's an easier exploration, lower SSI and hernia rates, and you're better off with a negative laparoscopy than a negative laparotomy. Uh, the risks, you're, you might damage something on your way in, um, and uh, your patient might, might be worse off um, hemodynamically. So take home, go lap, and convert early. Thank you very much.